Hi, I'm George Cox for BCTV. I'm coming to you today from our great radio station, Bedford 1051. Did you know, not only do we have all the varsity sports games, but we also play some great music, producer-driven, alternative rock, in my show, Disco Ball 2000. Check it out on your radio dial. Coming up on today's show, a tour of the Bedford Police Facility with Chief Bravonsky, post-election coverage of our local elections with Kelly Murphy, Town Councilor William Carter with some great information about how you can clean up Bedford, and right after the break, the vaccination clinic that took place over the weekend at Bedford High School on this edition of Bedford Community Corner. We've all been dealing with this pandemic for the last year, but there is light at the end of the tunnel with all these great new vaccines. And speaking of vaccines, the Bedford High School held a clinic for faculty and staff. We had a chance to talk to Mike Fournier and Scott Hunter about how it was organized and how it benefits the community. And I want to thank everybody. This is great to see the community support for such an important day. Uh, we're thrilled to be able to provide the vaccine on site for all of these staff from food service to bus drivers to uh, special educators, teachers, administrators. It, it's really a thrill. At the, this point in the pandemic, everybody is fatigued. This is a day of joy and this is a big step forward. And we're just so thrilled that we're able to bring it to you to make it as easy as possible because I do know, my wife is an educator, uh, how stressful and anxious this has all been and this is just one more kind of ratcheting down so we're really excited about being here today um, we've had a lot of practice we've been out we did manchester we did 1400 people in 12 hours last week so we've worked very hard with the administration with fire police to make sure that we had all of the components for a, a really quick flow my mantra is one we're not going to waste a drop of vaccine the second one is you're gonna wait shorter than you do at Market Basket or Hannaford. And uh, if we do those two things, we'll have a very successful day. BCTV had a chance to talk to Superintendent of Schools, Mike Fournier, and the Fire Chief, Scott Hunter, about the coordinated efforts to bring the vaccines to the Bedford School District's faculty and staff. The last few weeks, we've been coordinating and collaborating with the school district and Greater Manchester Public Health Network to uh, administer vaccines to all the school teachers in Bedford uh, that are ready to take uh, the shot. And it's not the only avenue that they can take, but uh, it's the one that's most convenient for them. And uh, we want to make sure that um, we're able to get the shot out to folks uh, that want it as quickly and as easily as possible. Uh, so about a week and a half ago, we sent an email just inquiring how many members of our uh, faculty and staff, uh, anyone who works in the school district, um, how many would want to get the shot. At the time, uh, there was there were about 665 people who were interested uh, on both uh, March 20th and the, the follow-up date is April 17th. Uh, as of today, we have about 550, 560 people who have confirmed, and so uh, we simply uh, put up a sign up genius, really, very simple. And people had to sign up for their time slot. We have four minute increments. And so people will sort of come in slowly as their time slot allows. Uh, and they'll come through one by one. And uh, we've been very fortunate The Bedford Fire Department uh, under the leadership of uh, both the chief uh, and um, Ben Selleck, as well as Phil Alexcos of the Manchester Health Department. They've just been fantastic in helping to coordinate. So we're excited to get our teachers vaccinated. 
So uh, when we use the term teachers, um, I just want to make it clear that that means all employees. So that could be paraprofessionals, custodians, kitchen workers. Uh, so we have approximately 800 um, employees. And so 553 is a pretty good percentage. Um, but keep in mind, a number of our uh, staff members have already received uh, the vaccine because they qualified earlier. Uh, or it was more convenient for them to call 211 or go through Vinny and find a date that was more suitable to their personal schedules. I, I feel confident that the, uh, the state and school district and town have gone about this the right way. Um, I definitely think it adds another layer of mitigation and protection uh, from the virus. Uh, I believe our schools are safe now, uh, but this certainly adds another layer for us. The vaccine that will be administered tomorrow is the Moderna vaccine, which is a two-dose vaccine. Uh, so it's planned here uh, single day um, for the school district um, tomorrow and then again in April, on, a, on another Saturday in April. So um, we're making this as simple as possible for folks. Um, logistically, uh, it's a lot to take on in a single day to administer 500 shots and truly a collaboration with uh, non-clinical staff coming from the school district, volunteers, um, really an outpouring from the community, as well as uh, the clinical staff, uh, not only from the fire department, but from other health care agencies as well. I think that we have about a list of five to seven folks that are clinical staff that are, that are also volunteers. And the list is much, much longer for volunteers because there's a whole logistical side of getting people registered um, and making sure people, um, uh, observing people after the shot to make sure that they feel well enough uh, to go home, which is almost always the case, um, but also to make sure that uh, folks are being asked the right questions um, and uh, to make sure they're healthy to take the shot. Well, we're pretty proud to take part in something like this because I believe the outcome of something like this is uh, to return the vitality to Bedford, right? Not only our community, but really our region. Um, and when I say that, what I'm talking about in terms of outcome is uh, uh, to have uh, better health, to have better wealth, uh, to break return of the economy, uh, and um, better quality of life for all um, throughout southern New Hampshire, not just in our community, but uh, especially for Bedford. Well, the local Bedford elections took place a few weeks ago, and here is Kelly Murphy, the newly elected town councillor, with some post-election night coverage. My name is Kelly Murphy and I am here today for Bedford Community Corner. We are in front of the Bedford High School Gymnasium, which is where all the action has been today beginning at 7 a.m. this morning. The polls are open and there are two hours left as of the time we taped this program for voting day for our town elections in 2021. We're electing two school board members, three town councilors and voting on the school budget and the sprinkler bond initiative today. There are a number of issues up for grabs and this has been an election that has drawn out approximately 2300 voters as of 5 p.m. So we're going to talk to some current candidates about what their experience has been like. We're going to talk to some town officials and we're going to find out where we stack up as far as voter turnout is concerned and how you can get involved in town government. We are currently standing at about 4 p.m., maybe a little after, at approximately 1,790 votes cast. Rick, can you tell me, is this high or low based on prior elections? So it's pretty low at this point, but we still have a chance to, to make our typical number. After, the year after a presidential election, we often see that there's a decrease. I don't know if it's just uh, voter burnout or what have you, but um, our, our low numbers are usually around 2,400. 2400 or 2500 I think we I think we'll make that if you put uh, absentee ballots that we've already received today which I think are around uh, 280 or so on top of that 1700 number we're over 2000 so I think we're on our way to match our typical low turnout year when there isn't major items on the ballots we are in fact at 2080 votes cast at this point uh, in the day up against our lowest in the last 10 years for a town election was 2400 ballots cast. One of our highest elections was actually last year we saw 3700 voters. So I mean do you think that voter turnout is low because of COVID or do you think that it has more to do with the fact that there was a presidential election? 
No, I, I think it's just what's on the ballot. The races are they're all good people running for the, the for the offices that are on the ballot, and I just don't think there's that barn burner of a of a topic this year that's on the ballot. So, I, I think that's all it is. Plus a little bit of burnout from from four elections last year. Like I said, it's it's not atypical for us to see a decrease in the year after a presidential election. So what are the hottest issues that were up for, for discussion on today's ballot, either on the school side or the town side? Other than the elections of individuals, what do you think some of the major issues are? Well, today in Bedford, we have this process where the school, everything is, is done on the ballot today, but the town portion is tomorrow night at, at 7 p.m. But on today's ballots, it seemed like the biggest questions probably were either the sprinkler bond article for the school district that would get sprinklers into the school system, into the three school buildings that don't have sprinkles, sprinklers currently. And then there's some charter amendments proposed by the, the town council. The biggest one would be a change to our planning board, which would change that board from a nine member board to a seven member board, uh, only made up of citizens at that point. Currently, the extra two members are myself as town manager and the public works director. And there was a move by the council that modify that board so that you only had seven citizen residents voting on projects before the planning board. So I think those are the big items. I'm standing here with Sue Thomas, who's a candidate for town council in today's election. It's about 4.30 p.m., so we are almost all the way to the finish line. She served for eight years on the school board. And I just want to know, like, what are your thoughts on the process? If you're talking to a candidate who's considering running in the future but has no experience with campaigning, tell me, how has this been for you and what has been your approach? So this year has been very different than ever before because of COVID. We've done lots of Zoom meetings and just tried to connect on social media with people. And then there's always the putting up of the signs, which, you know, is a process. And it's really just, just trying to find ways to get your message out to people and even just to get people to understand we're having a town election today and they need to come out and vote. I, I did notice you've definitely been putting the legwork in. I see your signs all over town. I see yourself everywhere. You participated in the men's club debate. You participated in the candidate forums. You did the, the BCTV interview. Is that really the key to connecting with voters is just keeping a presence and, and yeah. participating? You need to um, try to do everything you're invited to, everything that you can see, because you never know who's going to be tuning in. And with BCTV, you know, they might... In years past, they would be a lot of these would be live. Now a lot of it's Zoom, but they're recording it and putting it back on. So you never know when somebody might be flipping through the channels and watching something. So it, I just think it's important to, if you're invited to something or you know there's a forum, you know there's something that you can, you know, just get your name out there and encourage people to go vote. It's really important to do that. Tell me, the turnout today has been a little on the light side. What are your thoughts on why that is? I think people are a little bit voted out at this point. I think the four elections last year um, took a lot out of everybody and, um, you know, the weather's also nice today. So I just, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but you know, we have some years that are higher than others. I am standing here with town councilor Bill Carter, who was elected to the town council last year. You've now served about a year on the council. How's your experience been? Well, it doesn't help that uh, after 10 days of being elected, we go into a pandemic, but it's been a great learning experience getting out in the town, uh, just trying to uh, further my journey when it comes to uh, learning about the town of Bedford. What do you think needs to happen in town to turn out the vote in future elections? Well, when you, when you look at the thing, what, what's on the ballot? You know, what the big thing this year was infrastructure, and that's what a lot of the candidates are talking about. How do we make this the town that it is a great town to be moving to, that the residents love to be safe and have a nice community? And that those are the things. They, they, they voted back in 2014 to want to improve their roads. And that's what we're doing right now is making the roads superior to what they were back in 2014. So I, I think what you, when you look at some of the budget things that come up over the certain times, it's, it's what the key button point is. And right now it's, it's how to keep our residents safe in this town. And that, that'll be the key to get people out to vote about uh, the things that go on in town. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Kelly. 
Thank you, Kelly, and congratulations and best of luck on the town council. Speaking of town councilors, here is William Carter with a great event he's organizing, the first Cub Club Cleanup Day for Bedford. It takes place April 17th, and here's some more information. Hi, I'm Bill Carter of the Bedford Town Council. I would like to invite you to help me clean up Bedford. On April 17th from 9 to 3 p.m., the first annual Cub Road Club Cleanup Day will go on. I've been working with the Bedford DPW and the Bedford Conservation Commission to develop the Cub program. On April 17th, many groups and organizations will be helping with this project. Organizations and groups like the Bedford Rotary, Bedford Men's Club, and the Educational Farm at Joppa Hill, plus Boys and Girl Scouts, and students from SAU 25 will take to the roads to clean up Bedford. There will be four locations where you can pick up the blue bags for the Cub event, the Bedford Safety Complex, Bedford Library, the farm at Joppa Hill, and the Bedford Transfer Station. We ask everyone who helps on April 17th to work safe as you clean up the roads, wear gloves, and make sure you wear high visibility clothes. Always be aware of cars on the road and always walk towards the traffic. Safety is our first priority on the Cub Cleanup Day. April 17th will be a great opportunity to help and clean the roads of Bedford. Once you have picked up the road trash, you can do one of two things with the bags. You can take them on your next visit to the Bedford Transfer Station or just leave them tied up along the roadside. Staff of the Bedford DPW will spend time the following week picking up those bags. If you have any larger items, just leave them with the bags. The Cub program will give everyone an opportunity to spend the day enjoying the outdoors and help clean up Bedford. With Earth Day on April 22nd, this will give us a great opportunity to make our town a cleaner place. So will you help me clean up Bedford? For more information on the Cub program, Please email me at wcarter at bedfordnh.org. Make sure that you send your pictures of your group and family cleaning up Bedford. I want to thank everyone personally for your support of the Cub program. Well, spring is here. The weather is getting nicer. There are some restrictions that are a little bit more loose, and it's time to get out and find out what's going on in the great town of Bedford with Colleen Richardson. Hi everyone, this is Colin Richardson with your community calendar. This month we'd like to highlight a couple things from the Bedford Historical Society. First off, are you good with web design? And would you like to volunteer your time? The Historical Society is looking to revamp and modernize their website and they need your help. If you're interested, then contact Andrea by emailing lynch-zames at comcast.net. They'd love to hear from you. Next, it's spring cleaning time, and while you're cleaning out all of those closets, be sure to save those clothes and donate them to the Bedford Historical Society's Spring Clothing Drive, which will be for the whole month of May. If you have any questions about what they can accept or need help with dropping off items, then call them at 471-6336. The trailer will be in the same spot as usual at the Stephen Buswell Community Center at the corner of Bedford Center Road and North Amherst Road. So keep that in mind while you're doing that spring cleaning. Now this is the time for graduating seniors to think about applying for scholarships and there's some great opportunities out there. First off, the Bedford Men's Club has two $2,000 scholarships they're offering. Go to their website, bedfordmensclub.com, download the applications and get them in by April 15th. The next one is the Bedford Firefighters Association Norman F. Richards Scholarship. They're being offered by the Bedford Firefighters Association and you can go to their website, bedfordfirenh.org for applications. And again, their deadline is April 15th. And lastly, the Bedford Bulldogs Athletic Club has the Bedford Bulldog Athletic Club Scholarship and the Rich Byer Scholarship. The website is bbabc.net slash scholarships their applications are due by April 23rd, so don't miss out on these great opportunities. Also, don't forget to always go to the Bedford Library's website, bedfordnhlibrary.org, and the Parks and Recreation website at bedfordnh.org 
to find out all of their programs and events that are going on. There's lots of things that you'll want to check out. Until next time, happy spring. Here is the Bedford Police Chief John Provansky with a facility tour of the safety complex and he explains that they are in desperate need of a new facility. Hi, I'm John Provansky, Chief of your Bedford Police Department. I'd like to take a few minutes to provide some information about our department's facility need. In 1996, when we moved into the current safety complex at 55 Constitution Drive, we had 20 sworn officers. Today. We have 66 full and part-time employees, including 40 officers serving a population almost double from 1996. The amount of space allocated to the department at the current safety complex, about 8,900 square feet, was barely adequate 25 years ago when we were a much smaller agency. There is no room to expand. Our current station, a former office building, was never designed to operate as a police station, and major compromises to safety and efficiency were introduced. The exterior of the current safety complex is unprotected. Anyone off the street can and has wandered into sensitive areas. Our fleet, including cruisers packed with expensive technology and weapons, are not parked in a secure area. The department's most important assets, our employees, are equally exposed, as well as critical infrastructure needed to support police and fire operations. We're out of parking space and visitors often have to park on the street. We have no private interview space in the public lobby, and our communication center is not as protected as it should be, and it's not ADA compliant due to space. There is no interview facility in our detention area exposing civilian employees to persons in custody. We have no separate space to detain male and females in custody, and we have no separate and secure space to hold juveniles. There are a number of serious safety hazards in the detention facility, including steps and other features that are hazardous both to officers as well as persons in custody. Our evidence room is overcrowded and our impound area is not secure or even adjacent to the police station. Two or more employees share office space barely adequate for one, and some employees have no office space at all. Social distancing is impossible. We don't have enough restrooms and we even store office supplies in a restroom. Some personnel don't have a secure equipment locker to store their gear and we're out of locker room space. Sergeants have to change in their office, and we have male and female sergeants. We're out of space to store records and equipment, and we use the sally port to store some equipment and supplies that should be stored elsewhere. We now use about 8,900 square feet, but need 18,000 square feet. We've simply outgrown the current facility, and there's no room for expansion. Correcting safety and design inadequacies in the current station are cost prohibitive and won't solve our space needs. We're operating in less than one half the space required. A police station that fulfills the community's needs as well as the needs of the employees who work there is much more than brick, mortar, stone and steel. It projects the professionalism, openness, comforting, caring and devotion to public safety and public service of the agency and the town. The police station must meet the community's needs as much as the department's and employees' needs. Our current facility is unable to provide the basic necessities to function safely, efficiently and effectively, and we are unable to comply with several federal, state and national accreditation standards. I am incredibly proud of the work of the men and women of the Bedford Police Department. You deserve a police facility that meets your needs and the department's needs that serves and protects you every day, every night, all the time. We will always be here for you when you need us. Thanks for watching. Thank you, John, and we really look forward to having a brand new safety complex in the future. Coming up next, as part of our ongoing series of the Bedford High School, here is Christine O'Hara, Dean of Humanities, to tell you all about this great program. Hi, my name is Chris O'Hara and I'm the Dean of Humanities at Bedford High School. Our Humanities Department includes English, Social Studies, Film, and Video classes. At Bedford High School, our English and Social Studies core graduation requirements are team taught from 9th to 11th grade. This means that in Roots of Thought, the American Dream, and Global Studies, students are taught by both an English teacher and a Social Studies teacher at the same time 
in the same room. One of the benefits of this model is that our students are able to make connections between the literature they are reading and the relevant history they are studying. For example, when freshmen are studying the Renaissance, they are reading Romeo and Juliet. And when our sophomores are studying the 1920s, they are reading The Great Gatsby. Students at Bedford High School are able to choose from a wide variety of courses taught at various levels within the Humanities Department. We offer many different IB, AP, and college prep options in the areas of English, social studies, and film. This allows students to challenge themselves in areas where they might want to study in college while also maintaining balance in their schedules. Students can begin to take AP classes during their sophomore year and IB classes during their junior year. One of the more unique aspects of our humanities department is the breadth of our film classes. We offer five courses in film study, including video production, film critique, America through film, IB film studies, and IB filmmaking. Students may choose to take anywhere from one to all five of these courses during their time at Bedford High School. Our teachers are dedicated to helping our students become better writers, and this begins freshman year. All freshmen take a writing workshop class called In Writing, in addition to Roots of Thought. This class helps students improve their analytical writing skills so that they will be better prepared for the kind of writing they will be asked to do in the rest of their humanities courses throughout their high school experience. Regardless of the path students choose to take with regards to the humanities, they will be engaged in reading and discussing content with their peers, making connections that make their learning meaningful and relevant, and sharing their ideas through their writing. Students who leave Bedford High School perform at very high levels once they reach post-secondary education. If you have any questions about anything that I've talked about in the Humanities Department, please contact me via email. You can find that on the school website. Well, that does it for this month's show. If you have a story idea, or maybe you're in a nonprofit and you want to be featured as part of a video segment, then reach out to us at bctv at bedfordnh.org. For all of us at BCTV, we want to wish you a great week. I'm George Cox for Bedford Community Corner. We'll see you again next time.